Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. You're probably wondering why I'm doing a review of Pokemon Red and Blue in 2021, which, fair enough. Uh, it basically just boils down to I wanted to do more reviews on this channel, so I put a poll up on Twitter asking between two video review series which ones you guys wanted to see more, either all of the Pokemon games in order or all of the games that I grew up on as a kid because, yeah, there's a fair bit of crossover there, if I'm being honest. Uh, but you all decided pretty definitively for the Pokemon games, so here we are. If you didn't see that, and you want to be a part of that conversation in the future, you can follow me at Twitter, at DanielJMcG. Uh, I tweet about all kinds of stuff related to gaming and TV and movies and whatever, so go ahead and follow me there. But hey! I just beat Pokemon Red for the first time, despite having played it basically non-stop as a kid, and I have more than a few thoughts, so let's get into it. Let's start with a little bit of history. Pokemon Red and Blue came over to the States in 1998, the same year that such games as Resident Evil 2, Starcraft, Banjo-Kazooie, and Fallout 2 came out. Seinfeld had its last episode this year, and Sex and the City had its first. Saving Private Ryan was one of the biggest movies in the box office, Bill Clinton was getting real friendly with Monica Lewinsky, and everybody else was getting jiggy with Will Smith. But I was four years old, which is right about the same age the children start being able to form memories, and Pokemon was about to be one of the biggest things in my world. Between the show and the trading cards and the toys, I was already in love with Pokemon long before I ever even owned a Game Boy. In fact, I wouldn't have one until the following year, 1999, when I was playing hide and seek one day. You might not know it to look at me now, but as a kid I was an outside kind of person, and one day, playing hide and seek, I crawled into the crawl space underneath one of my neighbor's decks. I didn't even know the people who lived there. And what did I find underneath there? An atomic purple Game Boy with some weird Mario ripoff game called Mr. Nuts in it. <laughs> and being approximately four years old, I didn't know any better than to just take it home with me. Because why not? So, if in 1998, or early 99, you lost an Atomic Purple Game Boy in Wildwood, Missouri, right by Eureka, go Wildcats, uh, oh shit dude, I'm sorry. Uh, but, I knew as soon as I got that thing in my hands, that the first game I needed to go get was Pokemon. And so I talked to my mom, not sure why she let me keep the Game Boy, but she did, and we went down to Toys R Us and picked up a copy of Pokemon Red. And I played the hell out of this game. Eventually my sisters both got Game Boys, uh, my, the middle sister, uh, she got Pokemon Blue, and we would play it on road trips all the time, you know? Driving from Missouri to where the rest of my family lived in Michigan was like a 10-hour drive or something And we would play him the entire way there just you know waiting for street lights to go by so we could actually see it because the Game Boy wasn't backlit and at the time Pokemon Red was the best game I had ever played But this review is about how it holds up now and as a little bit of a spoiler, not well. I think I'll always have a soft spot for Pokemon Red and Blue and just nostalgia for the Kanto region in general. You know, it's it's where I got my first partner Pokemon. It's where I got my first gym badge. I love so many of the Pokemon from Gen 1. I'm a little bit of a Gen 1-er. But let me tell you, going back to it in 2021 is really hard. And, and not just because of the way it looks, because yes, it, obviously, you know, it's, it's an older game, it doesn't look very good, and I mean, even back in 1998 when it came out, if you compare it to other games that came out that year, you know, it just doesn't stack up on that level. Um, but I think the number one thing that I take away from Pokemon Red on this playthrough is just that 
Kanto feels really boring. Like, all of the towns are fairly indistinct. Like, they don't look particularly different. They don't feel very different. The music is different, and the music is one of the things I really like about this game. Um, but, like, every building in these towns looks more or less the same. And I think the place that this most stood out to me was on Cinnabar Island, which I don't think I ever actually got to as a kid. But, uh, you know, when you see it in the anime, which is the first place that I saw it, it's got this, like, active volcano, and it's this exciting place to justify why the fire-type gym leader Blaine is there. But in Pokemon Red, it's just, like, a rectangular island with, like, five or six buildings that barely fit on it. Uh, and the one landmark that it has, the Pokemon Mansion, just looks like a bigger version of every other building in the game. You know, it's supposed to be this dilapidated, rundown mansion that the that the key got lost in, the key to the gym got lost in, and it's supposed to be like this big, challenging dungeon. And it's it's just it's just boring to look at. Like there's just nothing really interesting going on with it, and that's really disappointing. You know, it's it's not great when <laughs> The places that I remember from the game are not places that I enjoyed being, but places that were extremely irritating to me. And, you know, some of that I might have been doing to myself because, like, I refused to look up any walkthroughs for this game because when I was a kid playing it, I wouldn't have had access to those. And so I wanted to see, like, can me as an adult figure out all of these puzzles that I couldn't figure out as a kid? And I did. You know, I beat the game, obviously, but it just wasn't a good time. Like, getting through Seafoam Island and doing that whole strength puzzle was extremely irritating, you know? Um, doing Sabrina's gym and, and using all the teleporter pads, but every single room inside it looks more or less the same, so you can't really tell where you are or where you've been. Uh, or, you know, obviously the Pokemon Mansion, like I said, where in certain places you're supposed to, like, drop down, and you can't really tell exactly where you can and can't do that, because just, like, by nature of being on the Game Boy, there's not a whole lot of visual information to work with. Um, or most irritatingly, I think for me, was the, the rocket base, where I was stuck in that dungeon for what felt like hours, because I had already beaten everybody in there, I had been to every floor, and I didn't realize, you know, I was looking for the key to the elevator, and I didn't realize that to get it, you have to talk to somebody after you beat them in a battle, and then they'll be like, oh, I dropped the key, and you get it that way. So I had completed the whole dungeon and just didn't know to do this very minor kind of obtuse thing that I had to do to progress. And, you know, it was just it was just not a good time. And speaking of Team Rocket, they, in general, as like a villainous organization, are also really boring. Like, it's they don't seem to have any cohesive plan you know they're just kind of like around doing various crimes you know like they're they have a base in the game corner and they're at Silphco and then they're in Mount Moon for some reason they're just like they're around and they're just doing bad things but me as a person playing this game I need more of a reason to want to take out this organization than those are the bad guys go get them like it's just not enough anymore, you know what I mean? Um, and there aren't even like particularly interesting characters in the game for me to like hold on to and be like, but I really love these guys. Like, I can only think of three. <laughs> like Giovanni, I think, is a pretty interesting character. I think he gets more interesting in later games if I remember right. But like, him as a villain, he's he's interesting. Like, he's a fun person to talk to. Professor Oak, again, like, he doesn't do a whole lot, but he feels important and he feels like a character that you actually, like, kind of bond with a little bit. Really, the only character in this game, though, that I love is the rival. Uh, I named him Gary. I understand that he's canonically named Blue, so I'll probably call him Blue going forward. But... He's such a good rival, like having him show up at just always the worst time and being like, what's up loser, I'm gonna kick all your Pokemon's heads off, like he's great, like the fact that he actually feels like a rival is something that 
I think it's lost in later games. I haven't played a lot of the other games recently. Uh, obviously, I'll get to them as a part of this review of all the games, but I think that that gets lost at some point, where like they just start kind of being friends who you have fights with. Uh, and but but Blue is just such a great antagonist. He's a better antagonist for the game than Giovanni, which I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing, but it's it's good for Blue. You know, he's genuinely a great character. Um, but you know, there's like there's not really a a villainous plot going on. There aren't a whole lot of great characters. You know. There's not really any story to the game other than get badges, be the Pokemon master, maybe catch them all. And, you know, as a kid, that was enough. That was perfect. That's all I needed. But as an adult, like, it's just not enough anymore. That being said, though, I think that the most important characters in any Pokemon game are your Pokemon, you know, are the, the bonds that you form between your team. And I definitely had that in Pokemon Red. You know, like I said before, I am a little bit of a Gen 1-er. I really love the first generation of Pokemon, almost every single one of them. You know, Voltorb and Electrode kinda suck because they're just a ball and then that same ball upside down and angry and like Porygon's a nerd, but I love all of the rest. And it's, you know, it is a good thing that me as a kid, I had the anime as a way to sort of see these Pokemon and fall in love with them that way. Because I think if I just had the sprites from this game, I would not have felt the same way. You know, some of the sprites are, are great. I love Fat Pikachu. I love Obese Raichu. Uh, Meowth looks great. I love how Omastar is waving at you. He's like, hello, how are you doing? Uh, but most of them are just not great. Like... They range from just not quite right, like Goldeen, Sea King, a couple others, all the way down to like, oh no, what's wrong with your face? <laughs> like, that is not what that's supposed to look like. Um, but my team, I loved. Uh, I know that a lot of people, you know, when you say that you're playing a Pokemon game, after which one, the most important question is, what's your team? So, for the record, mine was... Venusaur, Pidgeot, Nidoking, Raichu, Gyarados, and Alakazam, which I didn't know when I chose that team, is apparently a really broken team, uh, and they did make the battles fairly easy for the most part, um, which turned out is a good thing, because battling in Pokemon Red and Blue is kinda busted. In principle, battling works exactly the same as it always has. You know, as long as you watch your type matchups, you're gonna get through it no problem, right? Uh, there were some times where because certain Pokemon's types have changed in later games, I got messed up where like someone would send out a Magnemite and I would try to use a fighting type move or a fire type move against it. Uh, but the steel type doesn't exist yet, so it didn't do anything to it. Um, but you know, once I got past that, really the only thing that trip me up is that in Pokemon Red and Blue, the Psychic type is broken. Like, the only type that Psychic is weak to, as far as I'm aware, in first gen, is Bug type. But the good Bug type Pokemon, Scyther and Pinsir, neither of them can learn Bug type moves, so it, they can't take advantage of that. And the next best one, next, next best Bug type Pokemon who can learn Bug type moves is Beedrill. But Beedrill is also a poison type, so it does double damage to, or it does super effective damage to psychic type Pokemon, but it also takes super effective damage from psychic Pokemon, so it's like a complete wash and kind of pointless. Um, which worked out in my favor, because my Alakazam basically wiped the floor with the entire game. Um, <laughs> but, you know, even besides that, there were certain moves that were just super irritating. Like, you can get completely stunlocked by moves like Bind or, or anything that puts you to sleep because Bind takes away your entire turn for however many turns, turns you stay bound for. Whereas in later games, you can still act, you just take a little bit of damage every turn. Uh, and the same thing with sleep. 
in later games, at the beginning of your turn, you either wake up or you don't. Uh, and then if you do, you still get your turn. But in red and blue, waking up takes your entire turn. So you wake up, and then the opponent uses hypnosis or whatever again, and you're right back asleep, and there's nothing you can really do about it. And it's super irritating. But the most irritating attack was sand attack, of all things. Like a, an attack, a completely innocuous attack in later uh, gens was the most irritating thing in my entire playthrough. Like, when I was trying to level up my Pokemon early on, I kept running into Pidgeys and Pidgeotos, and they would sand attack me, and after like two, maybe three, there was really nothing that I could do to hit them, and I just had to either switch Pokemon or run from the battle, and that got really irritating. Um, like, I kept sand attack on my Pidgeotto all the way through the game so that I could use it against particularly tough enemies, and it's just a broken move. Like, it's surprisingly powerful in red and blue in a way that's really irritating. Um, but the opponents don't really take advantage of it super often. Uh, not just sand attack, but really anything. Because enemy AI is really dumb. <laughs> like, the number one place that I, I realized this was... Uh, the Elite Four, when I was fighting Lance, his Dragonite, which is supposed to be his, like, ace, one of his, like, his strongest Pokemon, he spent <laughs> the entire battle just using agility over and over and over again, which does nothing. And so I just picked him off with extremely low damage attacks until he was, <laughs> until he was done. Like, he could have very easily wiped me if he just used Hyper Beam, like, twice, but didn't even try. Uh... Or, like, opponents don't have a, a, a set number of times they can use a move. Uh, if for some reason you're watching this and you, and you don't know how battling works in, in Pokemon, each move has a, has a set amount of uh, PP or power points, and you can only use each move that number of times, and it's usually between, like, 10 and 25. Um, but opponents in red and blue don't follow under that rule. So when I was fighting against blue in the, in the Pokemon League, his Alakazam, I was like 15 levels underneath all his entire team, and he has an Alakazam, and I wanted to bait out all of his psychic moves so that I could switch to a different Pokemon and wipe him out while he was struggling, you know? Because when you run out of moves, you struggle and it does damage to you and the opponent. Regardless, I was trying to do that, uh, and he just kept he just kept going, and he kept using Recover, and I was using Recover on my Alakazam to just... And it just kept going for like 30 turns, 50 turns. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and I eventually just had to power through and, and fight this this Alakazam properly. And it was really tough. That was the hardest Pokemon in the game was Blue's Alakazam. Because it can heal super fast and it does crazy damage. But, you know, <laughs> it is what it is. There were a lot of other really... <laughs> what individually feel like minor irritations but got really unnerving like that throughout the span of the game like the fact that you can only use hms through the menu so you can't like walk up to a rock that you have to use strength on and click on it and then it'll be like do you want to use strength and you just say yes and you do it you have to press start go to the pokemon press strength use strength and then push it and then you know it, like in seafoam islands if you switch floors you have to do that all over again because it reloads basically um i hate having to to boot up tms to see what move it is you know to see whether or not it's worth keeping um i hate having a limited inventory especially because it's so heavily limited like you can only hold 20 things so a lot of the time my inventory got filled up with tms that i didn't even know what they were because <laughs> i couldn't see them without booting them up uh and i didn't so i just had to go and just constantly be stuffing stuff into my pc um you know, not the fact that you can't catch a Pokemon if your box is full until you go to the the Pokemon Center and switch over to a different box is super annoying. Like it should know to do that automatically. Um, the fact that you can't see your Pokemon in the box, you just get their name. So if you've nicknamed them and forgotten which Pokemon you gave what nickname, then there's really nothing you can do to figure out who they are easily. Um, and, you know, there's just, there's so many nitpicks that I can throw at this game 
that I could be sat here for another 30 minutes just listing off all these minor irritations. If I was rating this game based on the impact that it had on the world or just what it meant to me on a personal nostalgic level, this would be a very different conversation. It would be the easiest 10 out of 10 rating that I have ever given to anything ever. You know, because I have a lot of love for this game that spawned the highest grossing media franchise of all time. But when I boil it down to just this game standing by itself, I have to give it a 5 out of 10. And trust me, I, I hate to do it, you know, I but I can't bring myself to say it's bad, but I can't say that it's good either, you know? So it's just kind of right there in the middle, and I just walk away with the overwhelming feeling coming out of it that it's just kind of unremarkable. But anyway, that's all for today. So please feel free to tell me exactly how wrong I am down in the comments below. And while you're down there, please consider giving this video a like, sharing it with a friend, or better yet, subscribing to the channel. Follow me on Twitter, at DanielJMcG to be a part of the conversation. And until next time, I'll see you around.